Uh, it's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Caroline Moore. So uh, Professor Moore is a world leader in the field of early prostate cancer. Uh, you, may better, you may know her better by her Twitter name, which is Mrs. Prostate. Uh, in fact, she uh, surprisingly, she's the only female urologist, I believe, as a professor in the UK. So um, that, that, that really is amazing. Um, she's had a huge impact on prostate cancer management, and we're going to hear now from her uh, about some of her some of her 20 years. Is that right, Caroline, uh, in the field and what's happened? So over to you. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that uh, introduction, Shonit. And uh, it's great to be here uh, presenting to you all. And it'll be even better next year in person, I hear. Um, and yeah, just to, just to correct you slightly, Shonit, so UCL has appointed a second woman who is a professor of urology. She started three days ago. So Maxine Tran is now, uh, I'm not the only woman to be a professor of urology in the UK, which is, uh, which is great. So, well, first of all, disclosures. So I am a urologist. There's often some confusion about whether I'm a, I'm, I'm a radiologist. Uh, I work full time in prostate cancer and I don't do the operation to take out prostate. So all my work really is focused on what happens before that, how we detect prostate cancer, how we monitor it and how we monitor it after small treatments. You can see my disclosures here and my grant funding. So the traditional prostate cancer diagnosis pathway would be an examination of the prostate with a, a finger in the back passage, a PSA or prostate specific antigen blood test. If one of those two things was abnormal, then we would use ultrasound, which can see the prostate, but doesn't see cancer very well. And because we couldn't see the cancer, take 12 cores of tissue from the prostate to be looked at by our pathology colleagues under the microscope. And I think it's fair to say that multiparametric MRI has transformed that diagnostic pathway. So in short, it allows one in three men to avoid a biopsy that they don't need. We're able to detect more clinically significant disease and we're able to better allocate treatments to those men who need them and allow men who can be monitored to be safely monitored. And as Seanette said, this has taken uh, quite some time. So I was appointed as a research fellow at UCLH in um, 2002. So it is, uh, my UCL journey is, 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 is 20 years. So firstly, what do we mean by multi-parametric MRI? Well, simply that there are multiple parameters. As Seanette mentioned, we spend a lot of time with anatomical imaging and in the prostate that's T2-weighted um, imaging where cancer is dark and you can see an area here, oh, sorry, and, a further, um, and the same area in the, uh, in the coronal section. But what's been really important in prostate MRI is adding in other sets of images. So the diffusion weighted imaging looks at the movement of water in the prostate um, and cancer has a disorganized structure which restricts that water movement. And what we see on the high B value images just here is a bright area or if we look at sequences put together from multiple high B value images, a dark area just there. And then we also use dynamic contrast enhancement. And that means that we give the contrast and then rapidly take sets of images for a number of minutes after the contrast has been given. And cancer typically has an early wash in of that contrast through its disorganized vascularity, but an early wash out. So looking at the history of prostate MRI, the first one was actually done in 1982, so that's now 40 years old, but it, um, it's been developed more in the clinical space in the last 20 years or so. And I'm going to talk you through what we've done at UCL um, as, as part of that. And it's important to remember that things have really changed. So couldn't get the 1982 prostate MR image from anywhere, but here's the 1987 one. And you can, you can see that there's the shape of the prostate there, but it's really not possible to see very much in the way of detail. Whereas a typical 
T2 weighted image taken recently will show you a lot of detail in that prostate and we'll go into that a little bit more later. So where can we use MRI currently? Well, we use it for those men who are referred to hospital because they've got an abnormal blood test or an abnormal examination and we need to know whether or not they need further investigations. We then tend to go ahead with a biopsy. We're looking at either treatment or surveillance and we can use MR at the treatment time point to plan that treatment or for surveillance. And then after treatment, we can use MRI to follow up the patient. So Sean alluded there to the difference between finding something that may well work and implementing that in practice and in national and international practice. So just a moment really to think about what drives a change in practice. Well, first of all, you need expertise and you'll see very much how we've worked as urologists, radiologists and many other specialists specialties in partnership in the prostate cancer pathway to determine what is best for the patient. You need, of course, to generate data. So you need funding to complete high quality studies. But there's a third sector that's not always so well recognized and that's the political and social aspects of this. And this would include the government. In the UK, of course, we have um, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence who uh, determines national guidelines and national policies. And you have patients who feed into that and you also have third sector and in particular Prostate Cancer UK has helped drive practice in prostate MRI. Now it takes some time so rapid fire through the decades and I will go through these in some more detail um, and of course there's the planning, there's the clinical implementation, there's the publications, there is also from time to time awards which we've been, uh, we've been lucky to get and of course that's not the only thing that changes over time so this was my children back in 2002, my daughter Ruth and my son John, and naturally 20 years on they're quite, uh, quite grown up. Really important to remember the teamwork aspects because changing a pathway requires involving everybody from primary care through to the hospital teams, which include the urologists, nurses, admin, radiologists, radiographers, medical physics, PAC staff, and of course the pathologists and the pathology laboratory staff. So if we go back to the first use of prostate MRI at UCLH, this was actually back in 1998, so a little bit before I started, and it was in a research study looking at a possible new treatment for prostate cancer. Um, six patients had been treated before I arrived and I uh, wrote, wrote them up and um, looked at the images, and we saw that the... Um, the prostate was the prostate MRI was used to one to assess our location of treatment. So we did it in the interventional MR scanner and added in some um, light fibers to activate a drug. And then we looked at the effect of that between two and six days later, and then two to three months later. We moved on to a larger study of photodynamic therapy. So still very much in the trial setting. International, we're working with our colleagues in Toronto and they developed a better MR sequence, which we um, also started to use. And the idea of the MRI here was to see whether the treatment effect measured how well we'd ablated a part of the prostate where we believe the cancer to be from our biopsies. But what we found was that we could actually see the cancer on the MRI scan when it was a more significant cancer. And this was a really key moment. So instead of cancer being thought of as invisible on MR, you just have to do the biopsy to find it. Suddenly we were seeing really clear pictures of men who'd been diagnosed sometime before, come into the study, had a new MRI scan and we could see their cancers. And because we could see the cancer on the prostate in, in men in these trials, we thought, well, why don't we try and implement that earlier in our pathway so that we can bring those benefits to more people along the way. Now, at 
at the same time, and you see here the um, the influence of sort of um, national politics on things, there was a lot of concern that the UK was an outlier in terms of cancer outcomes. And one of the points of concern was the time, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, between referral to the urologist and diagnosis. And the mean across the country at that time was 115 days, so nearly four months with a median of 60 days. So whilst we were saying we would like to start using MRI in the pathway to diagnose men, we were also being told things need to happen much more quickly. So our practice of seeing a man, ordering an MRI, getting him back for the result, recommending a biopsy really wasn't going to wash. So with our, with our management team, we designed the direct access MRI clinic. So this started in 2009. At the time, there was a timed pathway and there still is, as many of you know, for urgent cancer referrals. And each patient had to be seen by day 14. You had to get a diagnosis by day 31, and this is still the case, and then complete your first treatment by 62 days. I mentioned to my colleagues abroad that when we don't comply with this, we have a lot of staff working on compliance and timelines, and there's a £5,000 fine to the hospital if you overstep this. So we decided on the direct access clinic where men would come from the GP referral, have an MRI scan in the morning. We would review those MRI scans with the patient details as given by the GP at lunchtime, and they'd see one of our nurse specialists in the afternoon. And what we saw was that nearly half of men had an MRI which didn't look particularly suspicious. And about half of men had an MRI which showed a high suspicion of prostate cancer, either localized to the prostate or already having spread. We then looked at how many of those men had biopsies. So prior to this, if you had a high blood test or, a, or an abnormal examination, you were recommended to have a biopsy. But we found even at this early stage back in 2009 that about a third of men didn't need a biopsy. Some men would then decline a biopsy even though we had recommended it. And we were doing standard transrectal biopsies and we still did those in a third of men. But for some men we did a targeted biopsy and for some men we did a transperineal biopsy to get access to the anterior prostate. And what we found, so here the red is the significant cancer, with yellow being slightly less significant and green being low risk cancer, the purple and the blue no biopsy or, um, or no cancer on biopsy. And what we found is that when there was a high suspicion of advanced cancer, the MRI was always right and there was always cancer in there, although some men were too unwell to have a biopsy and that when there was a high suspicion of organ confined cancer, the MR was mostly right and very often detected these higher risk prostate cancers. So when we look at the biopsy strategy, we can see that again there. So lots of red disease or high risk disease in those targeted biopsies. We looked then at our pathways because we were asked to analyze how quickly we see people. So the yellow bars of first investigation, MRI, biopsy and decision are what happened before we introduced the pathway. And you can see there, it was taking a hundred days or so to get to our decision to treat. And by introducing MR as the first test and making all our decisions after that, we more than halved that and the decision to treat was within 50 days. This was um, published in, in the BMJ um, at the time. So it's one thing to run a, a clinical practice yourself, but how do we make sure that all the data in the world, and this is a very common procedure, prostate biopsy, is of um, a translatable nature between people in different countries using different practices? So I convened an international group to look at this. So people who are interested in the area of MRI and targeted biopsies coming together to set the standards in an uncertain area. We came up with some key definitions. So an MR targeted biopsy is any biopsy technique where the target is determined by the MRI scan. And that can be done in an MR scanner, an inborn biopsy, 
with visual registration where you view the MR images and then the ultrasound at the time of the biopsy or using software to, to merge those. Here's an example of visual registration. So the radiologist outlines the uh, area of interest on a diagram and on the MRI scan itself. And then the person doing the biopsy who may be a urologist or a radiologist translates that to the live ultrasound images. And here you have an example of fusion software. So the MR scan is outlined and the tumor is outlined by the radiologist beforehand and the software merges that onto the real-time ultrasound view. Part of our recommendations were that targeted and standard cores should be potted separately because that hadn't always been done prior to that, including at our, our own institution, that Gleason grading was done per core, so the aggressiveness of the cancer wasn't overall for the prostate, it was per core that was taken, and that that cancer burden, the amount of cancer in a core was measured in millimeters rather than percentages. So when we get back to our clinic and we see men who have this raised blood test, that means they need further investigation. Should we do the traditional thing, the standard 12 core biopsy, or should we do an MRI? So the first major study to look at this was led by my colleague, Hashim Ahmed, and it was a multi-center UK study led by UCLH. All the men in this study had an MRI scan, they had a standard biopsy, and they had a transperineal mapping biopsy taking a core every five millimeters. So the mapping biopsy was the reference standard, and we compared that to the 12 core truss and the 1.5 Tesla MRI. And what we found was that standard biopsy detected 111 cancers in these 576 men, but it missed 119. So standard biopsy missed more than half of the significant cancers in this group of men. What we then found was that MRI detected 213 of those cancers and missed 17. So not perfect, but very much better than a, uh, a standard biopsy. So if we know that the MRI detects more cancers than the standard biopsy, why don't we only biopsy the MRI targets? So that was the focus of the next study that we, that we ran from, from UCL. And this was multi-center international study comparing, and men were randomized this time to a standard biopsy or an MRI and a targeted biopsy. This recruited very quickly. We all like our, our favorite recruitment graphs and this really is one of mine because we weren't supposed to finish till April 2018 and we finished nearly a year earlier, which was just a sign of how keen people were to get this question answered. And what we found was that around 30% of men could avoid a biopsy after a negative MRI. We found more significant cancers in the MRI arm than we did in the standard biopsy arm. We reduced our pickup of insignificant cancers that were very unlikely to cause harm, but could cause a lot of anxiety and repeated testing. And we did that in a much kinder way to our pathologists with an average of four cores per patient instead of 12 cores per patient. So about a third of the workload for our pathology colleagues. It's then important to look at do, can we use MRI later in the pathway? So we've done an MRI to diagnose somebody and then they continue in their prostate cancer pathway, either being monitored for a lower risk cancer or having treatment. So when we look at men on active surveillance, in the olden days of a biopsy every year or two, what we see in these, these bars here is that men are very happy to carry on with the blood testing on a regular basis whilst they're being monitored. But they're not happy to carry on with biopsies on a regular basis whilst they're being monitored because biopsies are uncomfortable and invasive. And the fact that the uptake is less than 10% at year seven suggests to me that the doctors don't believe it's a good idea as well as the patients. So we use for surveillance a, an MR-led policy. So men with 
low or low intermediate risk cancer come into the surveillance program. And we base this on the biopsy and the MRI findings without having any specific cutoffs for PSA or clinical examination. Once we're happy that the biopsy reflects what's on the MRI scan, they're enrolled and their follow-up is stratified according to whether they've got visible cancer on the MRI scan and their uh, grade of cancer on biopsy. So when it was last reported, which is now five years ago, and we're now up to um, a thousand men in the, in the cohort and it's due for a re-report soon, we reported our findings for men leaving this monitoring programme to have treatment or to be observed without intending to have radical treatment as they'd reached an age where it wouldn't benefit them or having a higher risk cancer found. And what we found was that when we looked at those men with a visible lesion on MR, so this is red line here, and the intermediate grade cancer, three plus four, they were much more likely than the other men to need treatment by the five year time point. So MR has allowed us to allow those men at lowest risk to avoid having to have repeat biopsies over time, to detect change when it's, it's um, seen on MR and then to confirm that with a biopsy in the small number of men who need that. And we've seen that rather than the one in four men leaving the monitoring programme because they're anxious, less than 1% of men left because of anxiety about biopsies and repeated testing. We also see that MR can be used as a biomarker in the presence of treatment. So this was a brilliant study looking at 1500 men who'd had the prostate taken out surgically for clinically significant cancer. And the team divided the men into men with visible disease on MR versus equivocal or occult or invisible disease. And they looked at the long-term prostate cancer outcomes. So biochemical recurrence where the PSA starts to rise because the spread of the cancer outside of the prostate, which has been surgically removed. Metastatic disease where you can not only detect it on a blood test, but on imaging the risk of dying of, of prostate cancer or other causes. <coughs> Excuse me. So the MR detectable is again in red. And what we see is that up to 15 years after having your prostate removed, if your MRI showed visible disease before the prostate was removed, you are much more likely for that um, to get recurrence where the PSA becomes detectable again. And that spreads through into metastatic disease, much more likely to get metastatic disease if you've got MR visible disease and through to prostate cancer death. So MR visibility of prostate cancer really is an indicator of significant disease, not only in a biopsy in the diagnostic setting, but even after treatment predicting death. So how do we get from knowing something is good in a single centre or even in a multi-centre study through to guideline change? Well, part of it is negotiating and discussing with the people who make the guidelines from a really early stage. So discussions with Prostate Cancer UK and the various uh, guideline bodies in the UK and Europe started in around 2014. And that meant that they were aware of the studies that were upcoming and were in a position to look at changing guidelines fairly rapidly. So we see in the UK NICE guidelines of 2019 that we should be offering a multi-parametric MRI as the first line investigation, and that we should re be reporting it on a five point scale, and that we should offer an MR influenced prostate biopsy to those men. This was reflected in the European guidelines in 2019, but with a weak rating, and that has since been changed to a strong rating. And in um, the, the latest to adopt it was the American Urology Guidelines in October 2019, where they've said that it is permissible, but it is not mandated as it is in the UK. And this is still a work in progress in the US, where only 10% of men have an MRI before a biopsy, compared to 85% of men in NHS England. There we go. So this was the 2016-2017 data, 80% of men having, the, having a biopsy before an MRI in England. 
And this shows through in, our, in who we diagnose. So we have a very low rate of diagnosing men with low risk disease. And this compares really favorably with other countries. So we all know that when we're looking at research and clinical practice, we can sometimes get different quality. All of these are cars, some might say, some are of better quality than others. So we looked at our training programme. So we set up the MRI course for urologists in September 2016. And what we wanted to do was not to turn urologists into radiologists or MR experts, but to allow them to understand the changes that they've seen and the changes that the radiologists were reporting. And we've developed a short course which has been delivered internationally. We reported the outcomes of our two day course where urologists were sent an MR exam asking them to, to read a number of MRIs before they came on the course. And we see that their ability to detect cancer really improved significantly over that two day course. And having that confidence in the urology community is really helpful when the urologists are the ones explaining things to patients and doing many of the procedures after the MRI. We looked at uh, translating this nationally across the UK, and we worked with the Pelican Cancer Foundation to do this and to take this out to other uh, large cancer centres and cancer conurbations. And we've done a lot of work across London Cancer in ensuring good MR quality across the patch. So what about the future? So what we know is that currently we haven't adopted a prostate cancer screening programme in the UK. And that's because when we screen using those traditional tools of the blood test and the examination to select men for biopsy, and we use a standard biopsy that doesn't take MR information into account, we know that we don't change the number of men who die of prostate cancer at seven out of a thousand with or without a screening test, but we know that if we do the screening using PSA, we will overdiagnose men, overtreat them, and cause more problems than we um, than we solve. However, we've seen how MR has transformed things for men at risk when they've been referred by their GP. What if we were to take that back a step and go looking for those prostate cancers? The UK has twice the age standardised mortality for prostate cancer as the US, Italy, Germany and Spain. And that's really because they do a lot more testing in terms of PSA testing than we do. So can we have a better screening test that would be suitable for national and indeed international adoption? So we have the Reimagine Prostate Cancer Screening Study where we ask men to come for an MRI scan and a PSA test. We invited men through letters to their GP and we invited men between the ages of 50 and 75. We wanted to see what the true rate of MR lesions in the community was and how well men responded to that invitation between different groups. So the MRI scan was a short MRI scan, a 10 minute clinical scan, and it was deemed positive or negative by our radiology team. And for the blood test, instead of using the absolute number that we've traditionally used, we used a PSA density. So the amount of PSA per mil of prostate, meaning that a large prostate didn't make you test positive by having a higher PSA. Again, we saw one of our most interesting recruitment graphs. We were kind of doing okay, a little slow to start and picked up. And then March, 2020, COVID hit and we paused for some time. We reopened in July 2020 and in fact actually over recruited and finished early according to our original target despite COVID. This is a man with a normal scan, so a really lovely looking healthy prostate there, no um, suspicion of cancer. His PSA was normal for his prostate size and he was thanked and left the study. We then see a man with a very a small lesion here on his MRI scan that was deemed positive. He went on to have NHS assessment in the usual pathway and had clinically significant prostate cancer found. 
So we looked at the people who were invited and we found that overall one in five men responded to a single letter inviting them for screening. This was done principally during the COVID pandemic and it may well have been higher if that hadn't been the case. We really wanted to look at who responded to the invitation because sometimes you can put out a national or generic advert, but the men at highest risk might not respond. What we found was that in terms of age, the older men were more likely to respond and they're the men more likely to have cancer. But we found that black men who have twice the prostate cancer rates of white men had a much poorer response than white men. And so we will be looking at changing the way we invite men in our next study. We see that one in seven men had a positive MRI and over half of the men with a positive MRI with that 10 minute short screening MRI had clinically significant cancer. In addition, there were one in 20 men who had a negative MR but a high PSA density and one in four of those men had a clinically significant cancer. What we found when we looked at the PSA distribution was that for those men with a positive MRI over here, two thirds of them had a PSA below the usual cutoff of three. So it may well be that MRI and PSA are telling us different things and we might need to do both tests in a modern screening programme. Some of the um, results have been uh, talked about and discussed and as you can imagine, it's an area of much interest. So essentially, currently, we use MRI before biopsy to plan treatment in an active surveillance. But looking forward, we may well be using it as part of a community screening strategy, determining men's risk by age, family history and ethnicity. I'm very happy to have any questions. <laughs>